thank you all. Um, if you don't recognize me, it's probably because I'm wearing clothes. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I wanted to come. Uh, I, have a, I have a very special message that I just felt uh, called to bring to you all today. Um, and where's the camera? And, and you, if you're watching this, um, I just want you guys all to know that you are going to die. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, isn't it interesting how normally, in a different group of people, that that statement is negative? It's like an insult. It's the worst thing you could probably say to somebody, especially somebody young. You're going to die. Instead of, instead of it being a, an absolute truth, like you're an audience, or there's gravity, or you are a human being, right? It's literally one of the only things that is an absolute truth in our entire life, except we, for some reason, have designed our lives in a way where we run away from it. We're afraid of it. It's scary. So much so that I believe we have designed our lives in a way that we distract ourselves to the point where we just spend our lives trying to forget that one day this is going to happen to us. Even though we know, because all of us have been touched by it, that eventually it happens. So we have this culture, right? We're culturally afraid to talk about death. Death is taboo. Hence why it's such a, you know, it's a nice intimate gathering here. If this were something else, we could be in, you know, a huge 30,000 know, seat auditorium. But the forward thinkers, those of you guys who are willing to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, gather here today to talk about this because it is such an important part of our conversation that we're not having. We should be open and willing to confront our mortality. And what I want to talk about today is how in doing that for me, it's helped me live a better life and how I believe that if we can learn to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, like all of you, that maybe we can, uh, Maybe the talk of our mortality can actually influence the way we live. I also find it interesting, you know, I'm in the entertainment business. Um, just look at the way we've been socialized in entertainment as a, as a whole. I mean, look at how we view death in media, right? Like you, there's an entire sector of the film market that makes billions of dollars that makes money off of all the just different glorified ways that people can die horrible deaths by psychopaths. Like, it's a genre film, right? People go see these genre movies where they sit for an hour and a half and they watch horrendous things happen to people. But then they never stop for a second and think, well, what if that was me? Or someone I care about, or my mom, or, or my wife, or my girlfriend, or my child. We've like numbed ourselves so much that we're just kind of living in this place of detachment. And I just want to offer maybe a, a different look at things, because this is really kind of how we think about death, right? It doesn't take like, more than like, a, a, a sign into your Twitter feed to just be like, overwhelmed and bombarded with death and dying, unfortunate situations and circumstances all over the world. We're also living in a time where there's so much information that's coming towards us at any given point, it's overwhelming, right? So I'm actually personally trying to avoid Twitter as often as I can, uh, because this is what I see. This idea of sadness and pain. But what if there is another option, right? What if there's a different way of looking at it? So because many of you are uh, like science-based you know, uh, people, I'm just gonna give you some stats because you all know them anyways. <laughs> Sum all that up, basically since I put on that slide, like 15 people around the world have died. Again, back to the fact that it's an absolute truth. So why are we running from it? What are we so afraid of? Why have we designed our lives in a way that uh, help us forget the fact that one day we're not going to be here anymore? Well, it's probably the unknown, right? This is me. Uh, that's a real bowl cut, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you remember that. Uh, and if you're my mom's age, you've probably done this to your child, and I hope that one day they forgive you. Because there was, like, she literally put a bowl on my head and cut it, and 
it's, you know. <laughs> uh, so I grew up, I grew up in, in the Baha'i faith, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about my faith today because it's a huge influencer of why I am doing the things that I'm doing and believe what I believe. If you don't know anything about the Baha'i faith, at its core, the Baha'i faith is the most recent uh, world religion where essentially we believe that God is an unknowable essence and he, it, she has never left man without guidance. And the entire purpose of religion is simply to love and help us remember that this is not the end, that this is the beginning. And essentially, we believe that God sends a different messenger or a prophet or a teacher to humanity to, to basically help us evolve to one day uh, live in unity, which we, I know, are very far from right now. Um, so that said, there was a central teaching of the Baha'i faith that is very much focused on the afterlife, uh, which I will, I will get into in a little bit. Um, but growing up, I found maybe it was because of my faith or, or maybe not. I, I was always drawn to the idea of wondering what happens when we die. Uh, and I remember being very, very young and having experiences with my grandparents or with other elderly people and, and just being young enough to even remember and be cognizant of the fact that they were closer to death than I was, which is a weird thing for a young boy, I think, to even be aware of or to think about. Um, when I would go visit my grandparents, you know, a lot of people like hated it. You know, a lot of kids my age were like, oh, you know, I got to go. And I remember looking forward to it in a lot of ways and asking them questions. And then I also remember every time I would leave, I would wonder if I was going to ever see them again. And it probably didn't help the fact that my grandmother was Jewish and always said, I might never see you again. Uh, <laughs> um, those with Jewish grandmothers know what I'm talking about. What? <laughs> Literally, like, you might never see me again. Come, come here. And, but I had already been thinking about that. I had already been interested, interest, in, interested. And I remember asking them about their love and their marriage. And then later on, uh, when my grandmother died, sitting with my grandfather and asking him how he fell in love and just f filming as soon as, as soon as we had uh, cell phone cameras that worked. I remember like taking it everywhere and asking questions and filming um, and just being drawn to it, which I also realized was not necessarily a normal thing because a lot of young boys, especially teenagers, um, would run from it. There was no vocabulary to even have a dialogue or a conversation with a young man about like death or dying uh, or you know, grandparents and wanting to get to know them. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a thing. We weren't socialized to, to converse that way. Um, this is my Uncle Louie. Well, he's not there. <laughs> and he's not here. So, okay, we're going to just go back. Let's see, let's see if this, we can make this work. Here we go. Well, thanks, Uncle Louie. <laughs> he was very funny. So... He would like this, <laughs> especially when you hear about the story I'm about to tell you. Uh, my Uncle Louie was going to be there, but because, for thing, because we'll talk about it later, I know he's messing with me right now. Um, so uh, this was actually going to be a picture of me at my graduation in high school um, with my Uncle Louie. Um, so I found out that my Uncle Louie had stage four um, lung cancer when I was 20 years old. And um, I didn't get a chance to know him that well growing up. And my, uh, my, he lived in Florida, and we lived at the time in Oregon. And I remember, again, this same feeling of, I need to go. And I remember asking my dad, like, can we go see him? So I remember we flew there. We got to know each other. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, golf was his religion. Um, and, and it was just this kind of beautiful experience. It was my first experience getting to know somebody who was actually dying of a disease, not just of old age. Um, a few months later, my dad called me. I'll never forget. He said, Uncle Louis only got days to live. He's in what they call hospice. And his wife, my Aunt Donna, wasn't doing very well. He said the family was struggling. And I'll never forget this moment. I just had this calling. It was like a prompting. And I said, Dad, I'm going to go. I said, I just feel like I need to go. So I booked a plane ticket, um, and I, 
I, it was like, and it was like a, a young kid saying, you know, I'm gonna go fight on the front lines, you know, like, like, a, like a debate champion saying, I'm gonna go join the army tomorrow. Uh, it, I had no idea what I was doing or what I was getting into. I could just tell that my heart was telling me I needed to go and I needed to be with him for whatever reason. Um, I remember getting there and seeing him in hospice and walking into a hospice for the first time and also feeling a tremendous amount of love. Like these were some of the kindest, sweetest people I had ever met and the attention and the care they were giving to my grandfather, or my grandfather, my uncle, Louis, was so beautiful. Um, the problem was that he wasn't letting go. And it was a weird thing for me because I'd never been with anybody as they were dying. So I'll never forget, I was, uh, I was in there, the, even the hospice nurses had pulled my, uncle, my uh, aunt aside and said, there's something going on, he's not letting go. They had him on the highest doses of pain medication possible and uh, things just weren't working and he was, it was uncomfortable to say the least. The family didn't know how to handle it. And I remember being very calm in that situation. It was almost like I, I don't know, and I'm sure many of you have this same feeling, but it was almost like being, it's like being, you know, cool in the fire. Like, I just felt like I was supposed to be there. And I remember asking, like, well, has he said, is there anybody he's been fighting with? Like, who can we call? And so I started calling people that maybe he had unresolved issues with and getting them on the phone and holding up the speakerphone. Because I knew, because he was still there, but he wasn't. He was in this process where he was seeing things and, and you know, talking to his sister who had passed away when he was young. And he was in, as we all call, transition. And, uh, and then that didn't work. So at the very end, uh, he had finally gotten closer. Uh, I had spent the night with him the night before, let my aunt go to sleep. Um, the hospice nurses had come in and said, okay, he's modeling, he's getting much closer. And his breathing was very labored, and I remember asking her, does he have any music? Is there music that he loves or likes? And, uh, and she said, yeah, he's got his old Frank Sinatra album in the car, and it's like a mixed CD of all the things that he loved. So I ran out, grabbed the CD, put it in my computer, came back and started playing music for him. And as soon as I did, he took his last breath. And it was my first experience watching somebody's soul leave their body. Holding his hand, he took his last breath. I looked over and, uh, and my aunt was just sobbing. And suddenly, in that exact moment, the song skipped. Halfway through the song. It just skipped on its own and I looked over at my aunt, and her, her, her sad face had turned into one of joy. And she was laughing. It turned out the song that it skipped to was the song that they had their very first dance to. And there was no shuffle. It happened mid-song. It was unexplainable. And that rocked me. Like, I knew that there was more, but that just shook me to my core, right? This idea, like, how the hell did that happen? How did the song skip? And of course it was, and I was like, then I just let it go. And I said, all right, there's, there's got to be something more to this. That experience would shape my entire life. And it's such, uh, it's, it's a huge reason why I'm here today. Every religion in the history of the world talks about death. Every prophet, every, every messiah, every, every religious teacher, it's almost like we have been asked to prepare ourselves for this thing, but yet we don't really listen. We skip over the pages that talk about our death, and we go straight to like, you know, how we can be happy or live a fruitful life. Um, this, is a, this is a quote I love. To consider that after the death of the body, the spirit perishes. It's like imagining that a bird in a cage will be destroyed if the cage is broken. That is essentially the Baha'i belief about life after death. But if you've noticed, we spend so much time here on Earth, in our lives, feeding the cage, and not the bird. I've made death a messenger of joy for thee, wherefore dost thou grieve? This is from Baha'u'llah, who's the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. This quote has altered the course of my entire life. It's also really annoying. Because sometimes, I don't know if you guys have ever, those of you that are spiritual or religious, you read some of these scriptures and you're like, come on, like, give me the cheat code to feel this. 
as if we were a video game, right? Like, although Elon Musk does think that we are in a simulation. I will say that, that if we are in a simulation, there must be somebody or something, right, that's still organizing it. So I don't think that him and I are that far off in our beliefs either. What's that? The architect. The architect, exactly. Yes, my favorite movie. I'm sure you and I can talk deeply about that. Uh, seven years ago, I, uh, I was actually meditating on this. And I was in a really low point in my life. And act, my acting career had stopped. It was non-existent. And, uh, and three in the morning, I was thinking about this quote. And I wrote down a list of show ideas because I realized that I wasn't being of service. I, I had been feeding the cage and not the bird. And I wanted to figure out, like, what am I really doing here? And I'll never forget the three words that came up that, uh, that I just knew once I wrote them down uh, were going to have a massive impact in the world. And they were My Last Days, a show about living told by the dying. And it came out exactly like that that night. And little did I know that that would be the thing that I spent the next seven years doing. I really believe that we need to find a way to change the conversation, to start a dialogue, right? Very much what we're all doing here today. How can we get the idea of dying into a mainstream conversation to hopefully start to influence the way that people live? Um, it was a conversation that we were afraid to have. And you know, at the time, this was seven years ago, YouTube had just gotten started. And it was you know, basically cat videos and people making makeup tutorials and you know, all kinds of things like that. And, uh, and I was like, OK, well, let's make it YouTube. Like, yeah, let's do that. People will watch that, right? You know? Little did we know that nobody was uh, going to watch that. Uh, <laughs> at least that's what they told me. Uh, we partnered with our good friends at Soul Pancake. It was one of their first shows. And we released My Last Days to the World. And, uh, and I had met Zach. My name is Zach Sobiak. I'm 17 years old, and I have osteosarcoma. I've been told I have a few months to live. But I still have a lot of work to do. I want everyone to know, you don't have to find out you're dying to start living. So Zach's documentary, uh, hold on, I'm going to go backwards real quick. Zach's documentary, uh, the week he died, was seen by 10 million people. Zach wrote a song called Clouds, and uh, he reached number one on iTunes and uh, became the first unsigned artist to ever hit number one on iTunes the week that he passed away. Uh, he proved a theory that I had that was, while we're all afraid to talk about it, um, we all have a desire to learn about it. And the thing about Zach that was so interesting was while he taught us all how to live, right? in reality, what he really taught us also was how to die. And it was the first time that this joy, I really just saw like how death and joy could be seen in the same sentence. Um, now, what was so interesting, everybody told us that it wasn't going to work. Well, it did. Because not only did it become one of the most watched documentary series in history online, uh, it's now gone on to be a three-night special on the CW every single year. The CW has basically told us that we will keep it on as long as you want because it's so important. And we believe that young people need to have this conversation. So the work that we are all doing here is wanted, despite what everybody tells us. People are hungry and thirsty for this type of content. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over. You can watch the trailer. It's all online. I was going to show you guys the trailer and get everybody crying. I'm going to skip over it, because um, I want to focus a little bit just on uh, why this is so important and how uh, hungry the, I believe that the general audience is. So um, over the last, oh, there it is. All right, we're going to skip. So I've made 25 documentaries over the last seven years. And every single one of these people exemplify the idea that uh, you don't have to find out you're dying to start living. And what we found is, besides the fact that tens and tens and tens of millions of people, I think we were close to 100 million views overall, have watched this show, um, the letters that have poured in, people have, have written that they didn't commit suicide because they watched somebody that had so much less time with them choose to live so beautifully. It's become a cultural phenomenon, if you will. It's also one of the hardest shows that I've ever made in my entire life because it's not reality television. 
It's reality. This year was really hard. Um, I lost three dear friends, um, and Claire Wineland was one of them. Claire, uh, if you don't know Claire, I encourage you to, to, to Google her. She spent her time here. She had cystic fibrosis, basically speaking and, and trying to help people remember that death is, death is inevitable. But living a life that we are proud of is something that's in our control and that we all have the ability to make our life a beautiful piece of art. And she taught me so much. I encourage you to look her up, watch her documentary. Claire passed away after a double lung transplant from a complication. Um, and uh, the thing about Claire that's also so special is that her memory is going to live on in a massive way, not just from her documentaries, but because through a conversation, um, she inspired what will become uh, one of the first young adult movies um, where two teenagers with cystic fibrosis get to have conversations like this about their mortality on the big screen uh, that I just directed coming out in March all over the world. Um, so, which is really exciting, again, it's just happening, because people are hungry for it. Uh, and then we decided to turn the uh, script into a book, because we really believed that people would want to read about it and not just watch it. And then last week, it became a bestseller on its first week. Um, so again, young people are thirsty and they're hungry to have this conversation. And next year, uh, which I'm really excited about, we're going to be taking another big step, and we're bringing the story of Zach to the big screen via our friends at Warner Brothers. And it's going to be a major motion picture. Um, and Zach is going to have a chance to now have his story told in a completely new way. Uh, because I'm over, I'm going to skip a couple things. But I want to briefly go back to this quote. I've made death, uh, death a messenger of joy for thee. And I'm going to summarize this way faster than I was going to, because I know that there's a lot of amazing speakers here. But what in our life could be joyful that could be similar to death? So in the Baha'i faith, we're told that for every physical law in the universe, there's a spiritual counterpart. So what could be the physical counterpart or the spiritual counterpart to death? Birth. Uh, and I'm going to run through this, but I, I, I'm, uh, I encourage you all to take this with you today. What if birth and death are actually the same? In the Matrix, right? Yeah. Now, the matrix meaning the, the, the world of the womb, right? A baby grows and develops. It's encapsulated in a, in a dark place. It's at, the, it's at the perfect temperature. Everything's, everything's been designed to help this baby grow, right? And what's the baby doing in this womb world? It's growing arms and legs and eyes and ears. It's growing all these physical things that it doesn't need where it is. It's going to need them where it's going. But it has no concept of where it's going. Right? It's existing both in the womb world and at the same time in a completely different universe. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, if we asked, so if we asked a baby in the womb, do you believe in mom? Right? The baby has no concept of mom. It can't see mom. It can sometimes hear mom if it's really listening. Right? But it can't see it. It has no idea that just an inch away is a vast universe. This is my wife, and my son was actually in that belly when I took this picture. Can you imagine trying to explain to a baby in the womb what exists just outside of it? We're finite beings, right, here on Earth. We can't comprehend the infinite, just like a baby has no frame of reference to the magical world that's existing just outside of it. Imagine trying to explain to a, to a, a fetus, oh, yeah, there's a, there's, there's a solar system. And like stars, and, and there's going to be air so that you, know, you can breathe with the, oh yeah, you've been developing lungs for 10 months, but don't worry. Like, you, we can't explain where, you could never do it. Not because it doesn't exist, but because we don't have the capacity to visualize it. Uh, and then one day, the baby's <laughs> born into this life, but it dies from the womb. So. What if our death is really just our next birth? And that's really, at the end of the day, what I wanted to talk about and what I wanted to just you know, drop on the group. Because I know that those of you already in hosp that are in the hospice and, and end of life are already thinking about these things. But this comes from a deep spiritual belief of mine. 
this idea that maybe this idea of, of uh, death being a messenger of joy is also for the other side, in the same way that when, a, when my child was born, it was one of the most joyful experiences of my entire life. So maybe it's about shifting our thinking. And I want to end with a quick story. That's a real picture of snot coming from my nose. Uh, when, my, uh, when my daughter was born, we chose to have a home birth. Um, and my wife was in labor for 35 hours. And, uh, and what's interesting is I've realized, having been through both experiences, how similar they are. Hospice, nur hospice nurses, midwives, doulas, death doulas, right? Hospices, birthing centers. Even the language, transition. It's an almost emotionally identical experiences. People waiting by their phones to figure out if it's happened. Families coming together. They're mirrors of each other the spiritual and the physical counterpart. And as my wife was going through her experience, uh, I was right there praying for my little girl and, and holding my wife and creating the experience and playing music and we were dancing and trying to just, uh, just create this amazing environment so that when my daughter went through her transition from the womb into this world, she was met with all the love that she could ever, ever imagine that would set her up for her entire life. And as she came through, and I brought her in, and I put her to my ear, and I, and I said a quick prayer, I had this realization that this was not going to be the last time I greeted my daughter's soul. Because she, as she came through that tunnel into the light, and I got to be there welcoming her with love and with prayer, I knew that one day after I pass, I really believe I'll have that chance to be there on the other side welcoming her again. And that completely shifted the way that I think about death. So what I want to leave you all with is your work is so important. I know people, it's hard to talk about with people. <laughs> I'm sure conversations are awkward when you tell them what you do for the most part. But if you have beliefs like this, or experiences that are magical, like I had with my Uncle Louie, I want to encourage you to share them with the world. Because we are hungry, and we are more open now than we've ever been for answers and for solutions. Your work is important. I see you. And please join me in helping everybody learn how to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Thank you.